Hello, it's Scott Manley here with uh, another part of my tutorial series. So we are on course for the moon, this time we're going to land. So it's a case, of course, of time accelerating out past the, er the planet Kerbin. And look, I aligned that perfectly. Our little uh, solar panel is still getting power. While we're up here, I can just check to see if there's any science that we haven't already collected. Um, you know, the only ones that you want to run are the thermometers, because if you run the um, the goo canisters or the materials exposure experiment, then those experiments will be ruined. So what's, you see what's going to happen here is we're going out and we're actually going faster than the moon, but as we come up, gravity slows us down and the moon will begin to catch up on us. So we can just see from here, look, the moon is starting to get bigger and bigger behind us. It's actually going to really start catching up, you see that? Anyway, what I'm looking for is the transition from one sphere of influence into the other. And what, how, the way you know that is by looking at the nav ball. I mean, you can see it in the map, obviously, as your orbit changes colour, but your nav ball will flip the instant. Bang! There, you see that? We crossed the nav ball. It says no target. That, that was just it changing uh, spheres of influence and things like that. So. It's not a perfect coplanar approach by any means, but I suspect that's what most people will be looking at after attempting this maneuver for the first time. Anyway, we need to begin a capture. So, to begin a capture maneuver, we essentially click at the closest approach and create a uh, new maneuver, and then just drag the retrograde vector, this little one here, and you see that that will slow us down and put us into a circular or an elliptical orbit, which, ideally, you can turn into a circular orbit, but uh, a perfect circular orbit is not really a realistic thing. There, see, 36, 31, that's close enough. So that's us set up, and we just need to fly in and begin our capture. Before we do that, uh, let's collect some temperature data. Uh, we've already collected high altitude temperature data from our previous mission, but it was just in case I'd forgotten. Okay, watch as the moon falls towards us, or we fall towards the moon. You know, it's both equivalent according to the laws of relativity. Okay, 150 kilometers there. Look at the moon admiring the dark side, or the far side of the moon, pardon me. Don't confuse the dark side of the moon with the far side of the moon. And don't be dwelling on such philosophy when you're trying to actually get into orbit. So I've just, we've got to the maneuver node, we're turning to point towards the blue navigation marker. And we're just going to light up our engines here, nine second burner thereabouts. So I'm just letting this run at a little less than maybe half power here. There, just make sure that we actually get out, because our, uh, our orbit is going to be a pretty low orbit. If we go too far here, then there's a chance that our orbit will end up hitting the surface before we plan on it. Okay, 9 meters per second. How close are we? We're getting pretty close. 54 meter, 54 kilometers. Bring that down. 14, 13, there we go. Okay, so yeah, that's us, and we're going to go around the dark side, and uh, then we're going to come back around the far side, and the far side is where we are going to make our landing. So, you cannot see the far side of the moon from Earth because the moon always keeps that face away from the Earth because it is tidally locked. However, you can see the dark side of the moon because the dark side of the moon is never actually totally dark. The dark side of the moon is illuminated by light reflecting off of the Earth. If you're standing on the moon on the dark side, it is well lit by Earthshine. And that's me just doing a quick save. Okay, now, we're going to land on the far side of the moon because it is light there, right? And we want to be able to see where we are, which means to land, we need to begin our descent maneuver on the far side. We're going to have to start firing our engines about there, and we'll just create a maneuver node somewhere around... Yeah, I think you want to kind of start early on because sometimes you you might want to adjust your, your orbit and stuff. So you want as much of the light side as possible. There, I'm going to bring that down to about 9 kilometers there. There aren't any mountains that high, but if you, say, get below you know, 5 kilometers, there's a real chance that you could actually hit some uh, objects on the moon. I'm not sure exactly where the highest point in the moon is, but you know, give it a healthy berth and you'll be fine. So 15 meters per second, not very big maneuver by any measure. Note that the maneuver calculation 
is adjusting itself as we are rotating. Because the rockets are modelled as a bunch of parts essentially flying in formation, the actual orbit changes a little as you rotate your spacecraft. It's not physically correct, let's say, but uh, <laughs> it's a consequence. Sometimes if you've got a very complicated ship, it's better to do your manoeuvre node setting while you're in time acceleration, you're, because that way you guarantee that the physics model isn't mucking around with your, your uh, carefully planned manoeuvres. Okay, and then we're just going to get right up close to this manoeuvre. It's only a little amount, and we certainly don't want to overdo this. We're going to use this rocket to begin our descent to the moon, since it's free fuel. And uh, rather than leaving it in orbit, it's probably nice to have it crash into the moon, right? You'll give it a Viking funeral, a Kerbal Viking funeral. Oh, overshot just a little, but I think we're good here. I think we're just fine. Yes, that'll be fine. So that, that'll that take us over slightly south of the lunar equator. And now we're going to move around until we're on the near side. And again, make sure you are saving again and again and again, because saving is very good. <laughs> F5 to quick save. F9 to... Hold F9 to reload. So it's telling us that we can't warp too fast. That's the only thing, because we're as the closer you get to the surface the less time warp you can use, and eventually you're not allowed to use time warp at all, except for physics time warp. You can always use physics time warp, and it will frequently destroy your spacecraft. But never be afraid of it, uh, except when you should be afraid of it. That's good advice from me there. Okay, okay, we're just going to cut that out there because time acceleration was taking forever. Okay, so we need to pick a place to land. You see our orbital track here? It's traveling over a bunch of craters. Ideally, you want to pick a place that looks relatively flat. You could try landing in the bottom of a crater, and there's a couple of craters there that we could touch, but I think I'm going to go just past that second crater. So I'm firing the engines very light, at the lowest setting possible. And you see how my orbit is now adjusting itself, and now it's starting to intersect the surface of the moon here. So I'm going to put the intersection somewhere about there, right? So that gives us that whole... Pl uh, that whole like flat crater free plane to actually begin my landing although what I'll probably do is fire my engine at 100% thrust once I'm flying over this crater right about there all the maneuvers that you're going to do right now are going to be firing towards that retrograde vector right that retrograde vector is the way you nullify your velocity and be aware though, if you overdo things and you find yourself going upwards, don't do the stupid thing and point at the surface. That would be a really bad, <laughs> bad maneuver, right? If you have a pilot, by the way, you can actually that has the skills, you can actually have them just point at the retrograde vector. Okay, but there's the crater we're looking for, and I'm going to just fire my engine at 100%. It's not going to last long. This is just going to be a quick boost. This is not the most efficient way to land by any means. But uh, I'm just going to do it this way because it's a little easier for everyone to conceptually understand here. So there, I'm just using that to slow my lateral velocity. And you see that my uh, retrograde vector is now starting to point above the horizon. That means that my prograde vector is pointing down, right? That means I'm going down towards the surface. See that? So I'm not burning my fuel right now. I'm only going at a... 100 meters per second or so, well, 180, whatever. And the real trick is now that we need to slow down, slow our velocity to zero just before we hit the surface. It's like coming to stop at stoplights, right? You just need to do that with a rocket. Now, you should figure out what way the sun is coming from and look for the shadow. You see that? That little black dot on the surface? That is going to let you know where the actual surface is because that altitude gauge at the top is relative to the lowest point on the moon. The lowest point on the moon is zero, which means the altitude here could be, it looks like it's gonna be about 3,000 meters, over 3,000 meters. So I'm just pointing my rocket through that retrograde vector and adjusting my thrust. You wanna keep your speed below about, you know, four meters per second when you land, and uh, they are adjusting that. I mean, these things are pretty tough, but you don't wanna bounce around too much. That's the real danger. Yeah, perfect touchdown. We have achieved lunar landing and nobody has died. Not even the probe. The probe is quite happy. 
And now the probe's job is to perform the science experiments. We need mystery goo, we need materials exposure, and we need a thermometer reading. And the thermometer reading, I'm actually going to transmit that so that we instantly complete one of our contracts there, right? So once that comes out, bingo, you see another contract completion? Okay, now to return, we're going to launch ourselves into orbit first. To launch into orbit, we're going to launch and go towards the 90 degree vector again. That'll put us in an inclined orbit around the moon. And then when we're in the correct position, we will burn our engines, escape the moon's sphere of influence and fall back to Kerbin for a glorious re-entry. Okay, so we want to take off towards the 90 degree vector, take a look for it on your nav ball, figure out what way you're going to rotate. In this case, I'm going to be pushing a combination of W and A. And I'm just going to turn right away because there's no atmosphere in the moon. And the only danger with turning too early on the moon is you could end up flying into the side of a mountain. Just watch your uh, altitude. You want to get it up to about 10 kilometers at least. And yeah, once I'm... Look at this. I'm just going to point it straight at the horizon and keep that going there. Six kilometers. Again, we're just aiming for 10 kilometers as being our target altitude here. Look at that. Eight, nine, ten, stop. Okay. So, of course, then we perform standard orbital interception. But beforehand, we should collect the science that I forgot to collect while we're waiting. I forgot to collect this science earlier. The goo feels right at home here. And there is a thermometer. Log thermometer temperature stuff. Of course, I suspect that a number of you did not make the mistake I did. And, uh, yeah, let's just transmit that and collect it, just in case. You never know, maybe we burn up on re-entry or something embarrassing like that. Okay, there. Get this. Log the temperature. Now the temperature is free to collect more temperature. The thermometer is free, free to collect more temperature science. It's rather beautiful, beautiful desolation flying over the surface of the moon here. So you just create a maneuver node, again, using the prograde vector, pulling it forwards till you end up in a roughly circular orbit. The, you know, the, the tighter the circle, the better, but it's not essential that you get it exactly right on. There we go, two minutes or so, get myself pointed at the maneuver node, and time accelerate. Try not to run through it. Or times ten. And one minute to go, 40, 30, 20, 10, 10, there, okay, fire those engines, stop, excellent, super fast, yeah, it didn't overdo it that time, and we'll get into a nice little orbit here. Now, we need to perform a burn to escape this orbit, and we want to escape so that we're actually traveling backwards along the moon's orbit, the moon is going in this case, the moon is going from left to right, so I want to go from right to left, right? So I want to fly around the inside. You see now that this goes out and escapes the moon's gravity and uh, puts us into that kind of orbit. And as I fire my engines more and more, my orbit gets more and more elliptical with the periaps after escape getting closer and closer to the planet Kerbin. Uh, you can see, uh, yeah, what's also happening is the orbit is getting more and more inclined because the orbit I'm on at the moon is slightly inclined. So, oh, yeah, you can adjust this up and down to try and get it in the plane. Uh, if you go for, like, a perfect coplanar orbit here, it will actually be more efficient because you see that as I'm adjusting the inclination downwards, it's dropping my periaps towards the, the planet Kerbin. Now the other thing is, I'm initially firing my engines exactly backwards along the moon's orbit, but because I'm in orbit around the moon, it's adjusting my position. So if I drag this maneuver node, you'll see that it's actually dropped me into the sun. I haven't changed my delta V, I've just changed the time that I've performed that burn. And there, so that's slightly better. Right, you see how this puts me into an orbit which actually kicks my periapoaps above the moon's orbit? Well, just by burning earlier, I'm able to fix this, right? And if you get the moon, uh, the, the post-departure periaps to roughly the same level as the moon, you'll be uh, better off because you'll need less delta V. And I'm going to need to adjust my uh, inclination again. This, this is to get the perfect departure orbit, right? If you have plenty of fuel, like I have, I mean, I could just do this in a simple burn. 
what I really want to show you is just how you can manipulate the maneuver nodes in uh, two axes to minimize your delta V requirements, right? The delta V requirements, uh, reducing those are good. Well, there we go, 25 kilometers. I mean, at this point, I could shave a whole lot more off of that if I wanted. Or maybe not a whole lot. I could shave a little bit more off it. Typically, you're going to need about 200 to 300 meters per second for a lunar departure and a curb and return. But this particular vehicle has tons of Delta V left, so you don't need to really worry about that. Now, perhaps you've had so you took a little longer to get to the surface than me, and you're getting closer to your limit, uh, to, to your uh, fuel limit then it's entirely okay to spend a lot of time tuning that to get the absolute minimum uh, Delta V requirements. It's better to save and uh, muck around with your maneuver node until you get the best possible departure than to run out of fuel because you didn't plot a sufficiently accurate trajectory. That, you know, sometimes those uh, good trajectories can really save you. Okay, we're getting close to our maneuver. 30, 19... Okay, probe, prepare to fire your engines on my mark. Three, two, one, mark. Again, I'm gonna burn at less than 100% just because we wanna cut this thing off at, you know, exactly the right uh, speed. Our descent will be at about 25 kilometers. If we overdo that too much, we could come down too quickly. You wanna make sure that you don't go too steep or too far out. If you go too far out, odds are that you'll just skip off the atmosphere and come back. Let me see. Uh, 17. I think yeah, that'll be okay, actually. We're quite light because we're essentially a heat shield and a probe. If we had a, a space capsule or a crew capsule attached, the extra mass would take longer to slow down. And so from here, it is actually relatively easy. It's just a case of time accelerating to leave the sphere of influence. There we go. Again, make sure that your solar panels are aligned with the sun because it sucks to run out of power. Now, of course, all of this uh, applies equally to a manned mission, right? If you've looked, if you know anything about Apollo, you'll know they did uh, lunar orbit rendezvous to save mass, right? That's basically where you had two spacecraft, one which landed and one which stayed in orbit. And then after they returned to orbit, they uh, used the one in orbit to return to Earth. That was important for the moon. But with Kerbin, it's not that important because Kerbal's moons, they only have like 550 meters per second of delta V requirements for landing. So... Uh, it's really, really easy compared to landing on the Earth's moon. It's actually, it doesn't save that much in terms of rocket mass. In fact, given the extra complexity of the docking nodes and everything, it may not save anything at all. Regardless, you know, I hope you take this design and work with it. You can also send this spacecraft to Minmus. It'll work just fine there. And in fact, this has enough Delta V to send it on a one-way trip to Eve or Duna as well. Although, if you're sending them that far, I would suggest that you put a little more instrumentation on them first, because it's a lot of effort to get a spacecraft out there, only to realize that you really did want to know the composition of the atmosphere, or the magnetic field, or the seismic nature of the surface, or things like that. So yeah, uh, I'm going to finish this off here. We'll uh, perhaps come back and do some other things, but that's a fine example of a lunar landing and return mission. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.